Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Byros, and I'm actually uh, the interim department chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine here at the university. I'm a professor in emergency medicine. I serve as the deputy institutional official for the university related to biomedical research, and I'm the vulnerable populations advisor for the University of Minnesota Medical School Institutional Review Board. I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Pearl O'Rourke from Partners Healthcare and Harvard Medical School. She will be speaking on changes the, changing the common rule for research with human participants, challenges for investigators, IRBs, and participants. Dr. O'Rourke is the Director of Human Research Affairs at Partners Healthcare Systems in Boston. She's an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and a member of the Advisory Committee to the Director of the All of Us Research Program. She has worked as a pediatric critical care physician at Children's Hospital in Boston and also at the University, the Children's Hospital at the University of Washington in Seattle, where there she was the Director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Her, her clinical research has involved research in extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, liquid ventilation, high-frequency ventilation, and pediatric resuscitation. In Seattle, she served as a member of the institutional IRB for many, many years. She also has served as deputy director of the Office of Science Policy in the office of the director at NIH, where she worked on issues including privacy, gene therapy, embryonic stem cells, and genetic discrimination. Dr. O'Rourke served on the National Working Group for the NIH-funded project, Disclosing Genomic Incidental Findings in a Cancer Biobank. She is currently a member and is the past chair of PRIMER, which is the Public Responsibility and Medicine, in Medicine and Research. Dr. O'Rourke has no relevant disclosures. She's going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a period for questions and answers. Please help me. Welcome, Dr. Pearl O'Rourke. Good morning. My first question is, why is there a trash can on that seat? It's kind of interesting. Um, okay, the one thing that Michelle didn't say is I graduated from the medical school here a gazillion years ago when I think there was only one building, so it's incredible coming back. Um, and yes, the weather in Boston is just as bad as it is here today. So I was asked to talk about, since this is changing is the basic theme, I was asked to talk about changes in the regulations. And the common rule is sort of the mothership regulation for the protection of human subjects in research. And I'm gonna use the word subjects because that's what the regulations use, okay? So in my, for this talk, subjects and participants, I'm seeing as equal. So when I thought about this, I thought, well, I could go point by point and say, like it, don't like it, like it, don't like it. But even that bored me. So what I decided to do is to say, okay, I currently oversee a large, well, we're talking here, I'm responsible for 9,000 protocols that are going on. There are probably five people doing something really stupid while I give this talk. And as Carrie said, you can't save them from themselves, so you gotta have some kind of system that holds them up. So I thought, what are the issues that give me heartburn? And what do I wish a revised common rule would help with? And did it. So with that, I'm gonna go through some of the issues and determine, am I satisfied or disappointed? <laughs> okay. So first, these are the three points I'm gonna make. The context, what are my existing challenges, and does the revised rule actually help? For the context, those of you who are not in institutional review boards, I think it's important to realize that the regulations or the formal uh, regulations we've had for the protection of human subjects are not that old. In 74, uh, the Health, Education, and Welfare, which no longer exists even, came out with regulations. These were modified. And then in 1991, the common rule, called common because 15 federal agencies agreed. That would take a Nobel Peace Prize today, okay? So this is very time specific. 
And as you see, it's to promote uniformity, understanding, and compliance with human subject protection, a uniform body. Nice, they're all gonna work together, we hope. What was 1991 like? <laughs> Hubble telescope was launched. The USSR comes to an end with Gorbachev leaving. The Dow average was 3,000. Terminator 2, city slickers at the movies. The internet f uh, first made available. The World Wide Web was first introduced. Think where we are today. And the common rule was introduced. 30 years later, Mars rover in planning. Russia seems to be expanding. The Dow average is 25,000 or above. We are now on Terminator 6, <laughs> which I think is a real societal comment, but anyway. Um, City Slickers has had City Slickers 2, and now City Slickers at Westworld. And we got 4.2 billion internet users, and the common rule was revised. A lot has happened. A lot of science has changed. Um, no longer do we primarily see single site research as multi-site, if not multinational. Genetics wasn't discovered in 1991. I mean, it, was, it has really come to the fore. And with genetics, the value of biospecimens and data, big. You want big. You want, I'd like some, a piece of all of you, not just you, but all of you. Information technology, big data. If, if, uh, the number of imaging technologies you have now, nothing like it was in 1991. We are blurring the lines between clinical care and research. Think learning healthcare systems and empowerment of the public, citizen science, democratization of research. And I'm sure others of you could come up with other things, but you're not giving the talk, so we're not gonna mention them. <laughs> okay. What else has changed? HIPAA, which actually is a four letter word, but <laughs> they, <laughs> So we had HIPAA in 1996, it was edited with the High Tech Act in 2009, and we also in 2008 had GINA, or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So a lot has happened. Now, how has the rule been changed? You may wonder why I have four elephant pictures up here. The gestation of an elephant is 22 months. So we could have birthed four separate elephants <laughs> in the time that we have been working on this rule. The way that rules are changed, uh, you can have a whole talk on that, which I will not bore you with, but it starts with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you guys think? And you can see here how the regulations might be modernized and revised to be more effective. If you go to step two, it's then a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is in response to some of the comments you got. That happened in 2015. The final rule came in 2017 and the implementation was delayed until this January. So this has been an 88 month process. And I'm not gonna read through all these, you can see it's all the improved human subjects research, and it truly is to do that. And while I'm gonna talk about some of the problems that I see, the bottom line is these are the rules, we have to follow them, and they are there for the protection of human subjects. So what are the challenges of the heartburn that I thought was hoping that a revised rule might help with? Gaps in and lack of harmonization of regulations. The elusive definition of what is identifiable. Investigator accountability. I hate to say it, our weakest link are investigators. Blurred lines between research, clinical care, and quality. Return of research results and informed consent just doesn't work. So I'm gonna do a little bit deeper dive, real deep on the first couple, and don't worry, the end is only one slide per, okay, if you're, as you're looking at your watch. Okay, so has the revised rule helped? What about gaps in the regulations? The common rule only covers research supported or conducted by the federal signatories. FDA is not a signatory. FDA has its own regulations for anything that they cover. They're mostly the same, but they're not totally the same. What about non-federally funded, non-FDA regulated research? Is that covered by anything? Well, I'm gonna give you this wonderful story, which is old, but it could be current. Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital in 1992 and three wanted to do a study looking at facelifts, an aggressive way and a less aggressive way. 
both were done at their institutions. So they got 20 women, one man, and they had different teams of surgeons do aggressive and less aggressive on the two sides of the face. No federal funds, not FDA regulated. Have a nice day. No IRB review. Um, you can see here, patient signed a general consent form. The PI said, uh, they also told them, we're going to do, get this, different procedures on the different sides of your face as we need for your face. Oh. The investigator said, this was a straightforward clinical kind of study. Does the word study, did that ever get into his cortex? I don't think so. It's done all the time. It was a clinical project. These were not experimental procedures. We didn't need to go to the IRB, and I sit on the IRB myself because it wasn't investigative research. He called it a study and research and said, no, this doesn't need to go to the IRB. I put this here to show this was published. I'm not making this little story up. Then there was a letter. Dear sir, I am writing anonymously to inform you of this unauthorized medical study on unknowing human clinic patients. These people had two different doctors and operations, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we are not guinea pigs. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to thank you. <laughs> Federal officials were alerted by this anonymous complaint. They investigated and determined they had no jurisdiction. <clears throat> Oversight in the U.S., and this is not to scale. This is just to make the point. The majority of research that was done at our institutions is federally funded and covered by the common rule. If it's not federally funded and it's done at your institution, our institutions extend the common rule to anything any of our guys do. Then there's the FDA covered, but there is this small group of non-common rule, non-FDA regulated research. I don't know of any other country that tethers human subjects protection to funding, which is essentially what this does. So if you were to give this talk in another country, they think you're nuts which, you know, we may be. Are there new gaps or potential gaps? Citizen science. Some citizen science definitely goes through the routine processes. Some have their own um, in relationships with IRBs. But you could be self-funded, not FDA regulated, and you could publish online. This is happening. The gap fillers, as I said, most institutions apply research oversight the same, regardless of if it's NIH, if it's federally funded or not. And also, journals will ask for your IRB approval. So there are ways to fill the gaps, but there are gaps. Was there gap reduction with the revised rule? No. During the process, there was a tiny little glimmer, maybe, where they thought maybe they'd expand coverage to clinical trials that were not federally funded, but this did not end up in the final rule. I don't think this would have changed much anyway. So the revised rule did not help with this, but I think to be fair, I'm not sure a revision of the common rule was the place where this could have been fixed. It would have been nice to have some discussion about it, and there was none. What about harmonization? Where is there disharmony? I already told you the FDA regs and the common rule are different. I'd like to talk a little bit about HIPAA. Um, and also, agencies, particularly the NIH, put out conditions of grant award and policy that for the world are regulations. Think about the single IRB mandate that came out over a year ago. If you have NIH funding and multi-site research, you shall use a single IRB or not get the money. Um, certainly feels like a regulation. Now HIPAA, just quickly to go through some of this. Um, definition of identifiable is very different. Common rule allows judgment. HIPAA, very prescriptive. The scope, um, HIPAA covers protected health information that is held by a covered entity. It includes live people, and it covers you until you are dead for 50 years. 50 years in one day, you are no longer covered. Who knows? Um, the common rule only covers people who are alive, OK? Uh, HIPAA only cover, yeah, protects against privacy and confidentiality issues. The common rule goes way beyond that into human subjects protections. The permissions are different. You can waive permission, but if you waive it under HIPAA, you may have to track any sort of disclosures. Common rule doesn't have anything like that. And the oversight bodies are different. In most institutions, the IRB serves as the privacy board, but it may not be the case. Is that me? No, okay. Okay, so does the revised rule help with harmonization between signatories a little bit? 
in that it says they, they want signatories to consult before they issue guidance. So you don't get, you know, the VA gives you this way, this guidance, OHRP gives you this guidance, so to try to do that. But they also say, well, if it's not feasible, each of you can go ahead and do whatever the hell you like to do. Does it help with the FDA and HIPAA? No. But I think the same question is there. Was the revised rule the vehicle by which to do this? But this is a problem. Second, the elusive definition of identifiability. Identifiability is critical for those of us who have to implement the common rule. Laws really work on definitions. And the definition of human subject, which is here, you already knew it's a living person because I told you from the other slide, but it's a living individual where, about whom somebody doing research obtains information or biospecimens through an interaction. A biopsy, a phone call, a survey, and anything like that, okay? It can be from the minor to major. Or obtains, uses, studies, analyzes identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens. Your medical chart is a human subject. The definition of identifiable, per the regulation, private information for which the identity of the subject is or may readily be ascertained by the investigator or associated with the information. Real, you know, kind of a lot of judgment there. Very unlike, excuse me, the HIPAA. But for the common rule, for existing information, we have to do this. Is it identifiable? By whose definition of identifiability? If it's not identifiable, clear sailing. You don't have to do anything for the common rule. If it is identifiable, you get the full Monty. Okay? You get everything we can possibly think you can, <laughs> would not like. So HIPAA identifiability, there are two ways of doing this. You can have an expert certification. We can't find this expert. You know, but if you can find some smart dude or woman who said, I really know, you know, I'm, I'm a data maven here, and I can, I'll sign that this is not identifiable, we cannot find them in Boston. So most people go with the safe harbor, which you've got to get rid of 18 identifiers. Some of them are listed here. Some of them make sense. Name, address, medical record number, dates, account numbers. Did you know that your vehicle identification number is a HIPAA identifier? You know, on the front of your dash, there's this little copper plate that has about 58, as you can see here, little numbers. That is a HIPAA identifier. And if we have time later, we can talk about why that is. But I think that's a real question. Is genetic information identifiable? How many think it is? How many think it isn't? And the rest of you have no thought process. Okay. <laughs> All right, that helps me with the rest of the talk, too. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't give the, I, you know, those of you who didn't answer probably were the smart ones because you thought, well, how much information are you talking about? Is it a whole genome sequence, a whole exome sequence? You know, how about 48 SNPs? How about 46 SNPs? I mean, so it really depends on what it is. Um, notice that the common rule doesn't really tell you, okay? HIPAA does not cover a genetic sequence. It will cover it if it's linked to one of those 18 identifiers. So, so far, HIPAA, you're home free. Now, for an IRB, you gotta think about all these things. And another thing that's come down the pike is another definition of identifiable through the certificates of confidentiality. Certificates are things that you apply for if you are doing research on identifiable sensitive information and it precludes forced disclosure. Okay, so it's protect people if you're really doing kind of the, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll research. And here, identifiable sensitive information includes human subjects research as defined by the common rule, research with biospecimens that are identifiable. Get the one that I bolded. Generation of individual level human genomic data from biospecimens or the use of such data regardless of identifiability. Notice that identifiable information includes stuff regardless of identifiability. You know, English 101 would have redlined this in a nanosecond. But here we have it. So my concern here is that this suggests that genetic information is identifiable and sensitive. And is this putting the camel's nose under the tent? 
I would also add that in the process of the revised common rule, there was a suggestion that biospecimens, regardless of identifiability, were going to be human subjects. And my interpretation of that, if you have a hunk of somebody, you can get a genetic sequence, and that is identifiable. So I would watch this page, not this specific page, but this topic very well. So what is the problem? Information not covered by the common, common rule may now be covered by HIPAA. It may require a certificate of confidentiality. It's exempt from oversight, or it's not even human subjects research, and you gotta get a certificate of confidentiality. Kind of difficult to make that make sense. And nobody knows what to do with genetic information. How does the revised rule help or not help? Well, they decided that within a year, within a year of what time, I'm not certain, but within a year, they are going to re-examine the definition of identifiability, and they promise that every four, no less than every four years, they will do the same re-examination. Their focus will be on analytic technologies and identifiable biospecimens. I think that in the future, big data, we now know that you can triangulate from de-identified data sets to find Susan Wolf. You know, if you want to find her, but if you do, she's right here. Um, <laughs> as well as, I think the issue of biospecimens give you genetics, and our genetics is a genetic information of some amount identifiable. So I would very much watch this page and remember if the decision is that biospecimens are identifiable, they become human subjects, going back to the initial definition of human subject. So did the revised rule help with identifiability? No, it only kicked the can down the road, but there is a plan. So I do applaud the fact that they are looking at this. Number three, investigator accountability. I mean, I love this, not me, their fault. I didn't know. Why didn't you call me and tell me that? I had one guy call and say, how come you didn't personally call me and tell me the, the common rule had been revised? And you go, really? Yeah, you were the next one I was going to call. <laughs> this is Henry Beecher, who in 1955 wrote the um, incredible article in which he identified in major journals, pub or, yeah, publications that were essentially unethical. And if you haven't Googled him, you really should Google him. He was an anesthesiologist at Mass General in Boston. And what you can see here is he introduced the idea that the best protection for subjects is the enlightened and ethically sensitive conscience of the investigator. In addition to the requirement of informed consent, the presence of an intelligent, informed, conscientious, compassionate, responsible investigator offers the best protection for research subjects. Does a common rule hold an investigator accountable? No. It only holds the institution accountable, and the institution can then delegate. FDA regulations hold the investigator accountable. Um, and I just put two of the subparts in the FDA regs, again, that you can see responsibilities of sponsors and investigators. 2011, this is when the revision of the common rule first started. Um, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. The common rule should be revised to include a section directly addressing the responsibility of investigators, bring it into harmony with the FDA regs, um, make the obligations of individual researchers more explicit and contribute to a building a stronger culture of responsibility among investigators. The Secretary's Advisory Committee uh, in 2013, and again, sort of midway through this process, said the same thing. We need to make investigators accountable, and the common rule is the vehicle for that. The revised rule did not do this. And I would posit that the revised rule actually increases the responsibility of investigators without telling them they're accountable. And two ways that they increase the responsibility there is a category of research that's called exempt, which it means if you're exempt, you are not, you don't have to follow the regulations, okay? They've expanded those. Also, the, the, and I'll get to continuing review in a minute, but first of the exempt, consider these two. Survey research, I wanna look at suicidality in sex workers, and I'm going to record identifiable data. It's a survey. 
There will be a one-time limited IRB review, which is new, which only looks at privacy and confidentiality. There is no risk-benefit analysis of the research, and this would be exempt in perpetuity. Another one, I want to access and record 100,000 identifiable medical records to evaluate emergency room use based on socioeconomic status using a zip code as a marker. Okay, as long as compliant with HIPAA. No further oversight. Now, there are exempt categories from the old rule as well, but the expansion, particularly in these two cases of recording identifiable information, I think pushes the risk of these much further. Continuing review, the regulations, the old regulations require that anything that is initially approved must then be re-looked at at a routine time. If it's federally funded, it has to be annual. If it's not federally funded, you can push it out for two or three years. What the revised rule does is it says, you shall not do continuing review unless you make some exception for research that was initially approved by an expedited process. This would be any research that's no more than minimal risk. Um, you know, blood study, that, this is a huge category actually. About, uh, as I said, 9,000 protocols we have, I would say it's probably 6,500 are minimal risk research. Okay, so it's a huge number. Um, many of these have consent forms. Also, if you have been approved by full committee, which means that it's more than minimal risk, once, oh, that was, must have been a bad photo. <laughs> Want me to do that again? Okay, okay. <laughs> you will not do continuing review once the research has gotten to the point of data analysis only, which I think is great. I think at that point it was stupid to do it or if there is no further interaction, but all you're doing is collecting routine clinical information, okay? But investigators, even though they're not gonna come for continuing review, are still responsible for all of the other parts of the common rule. So in a way you say, well, well this doesn't sound all that bad. Continuing review is our wake up call to investigators. It is amazing what you see on an annual basis. Just some examples, deviations. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, we dropped that arm of the protocol. Oh, we changed the antibiotic. Oh, we changed, we're doing another x-ray. Um, Over-enrolled, enthusiastic. You approved me for 50 participants. I've enrolled 250. It's like, oh really, you know, come on down. Um, <laughs> the PI died, there's a new investigator. Um, oh, the informed consent form no longer did anything, so we gave them an addenda that never came through the IRB. Our fear is that without the wake up call of continuing review, our investigators, these things are gonna fall through the cracks. So what we and many other institutions are doing is we are now putting in institutional check-in. And anyone who is no longer gonna have continuing review per the IRB, they're gonna have an institutional check-in, which for the world is gonna look like continuing review to them, but it won't be a regulatory review. Because of the expanded exempt categories, we're doing the same thing now for exempt research, which we have not done to this point. So it is shifting the stuff. So did the revised rule help with investigator accountability? No, and I think this is one of the biggest no's. I think this is a huge opportunity lost. What about the blurring of the research clinical interface? Um, learning healthcare systems, CER research, <laughs> quality improvement, no one ever knows what to do with these things. Um, this is from the Institute of Medicine, where they call on healthcare leaders to transform their health systems into learning healthcare systems, carrying out you know, investigations from clinical effectiveness studies to quality improvement, but there are many challenges. One of these challenges is a lingering uncertainty about whether the data collection and monitoring central to learning healthcare systems is actually research. If so, what kind of ethical oversight should it have? There's been no foundational analysis of the fit between existing regulations and these new kinds of research. So let me give you a couple examples. You wanna look at drug A versus drug B for hypertension. Both drugs are incredibly similar, okay? That's the same cost, same side effects, yada, yada. But clinicians in your hospital have a preference some really like A, some really like B, probably based on nothing. The study design, 
All patients in clinic A will receive drug A. All patients in clinic B will receive drug B. Does this need a full IRB review? Should patients be asked for informed consent? I can't answer those. What if you are seeing a doctor in clinic A who have you seen for the last 20 years and who you adore, and this doctor only does stuff for you and loves drug A, drug, drug B, I'm sorry, and now has to use drug A? Should you know that? Is the doctor a subject? Another example, surgical soap. You'd like to compare the current surgical soap versus a new soap. Endpoints are going to be post-op infection rates, which as a pre-op patient I'm quite interested in, and whether or not the surgeons get a rash. The design, for three months you're going to keep going with the current soap and really collect a lot of data, and then for three months you're going to use the new soap. Is this research? Is it quality improvement? What level of oversight? Should pre-op patients know that you're changing your routine, which has worked so well? You have a zero infection rate on the current stuff. So B is cheaper. Okay, that's the problem. Has revised rule of help? No. <laughs> Did the process try to help? Well, in the advance notice, the very first step, they, were, they actually had this whole different category, they call it excluded. These then became exempt, okay? So think of that. But in there, they were talking about exempting or excluding certain quality assurance, quality improvement activities, and internal program improvement activities. This got dropped because it was too confusing. Well, if it was confusing for them, it's confusing for us. We need help in this space dramatically. And you will find different IRBs do this very differently, and we drive the investigators nuts. And this is definitely multi-site research. So this is another area where I think there was a, you know, there was a lot of hope that maybe something would come out of this and it hasn't. Informed consent deficiencies. Informed consents, too long, too legalistic, a complete redo is needed. I think most people would agree with that. The revised rule has a number of things for informed consent. They talk about reformatting, organizing the whole thing for better comprehension, great. New elements, in one way they say it's too long, so they've added four new elements that we have to include. <laughs> um, and then there are new key elements section. And the new key elements section is to be a one to two pager that is before the informed consent form that has all of the information a reasonable person would need to make a decision. Now, I think actually we, we asked, is this an executive summary? We were told no. It's like, really? Um, well, what is it? Well, we'll develop guidance. Guidance has not yet come out on this. And the rule's been in play. We've been implementing since January 21st. Um, the new key element section, I think, actually has some very good opportunity here to really synthesize down you know, these are the major things you need to think about. The concerns we have, though, are you still have the whole consent form. We shall not put all of the adverse events in a key elements, but how are you going to guarantee that the participant or the person thinking about joining is going to actually read the entire informed consent form? So my concern is that even if the key elements is a great idea, unless we really change the informed consent form itself, I think we're whistling Dixie. And <laughs> I almost took this slide out. I think that <laughs> the key elements could be from the lipstick on the pig. So I think we really, really need to look at the informed consent form. So I think, did the revised rule push informed consent a little bit? Maybe. We need to see guidance, and I really think we need a deeper dive on the informed consent form. Return of research results. And I can see Susan Wolf just spinning in her seat here. This is one of her favorite topics. Um, years ago, it was easy to say, thank you for being in the research. We're never going to tell you anything about what happened. Did it have a nice day? Um, that is no longer acceptable or the expectation. The expectation really is that people will get stuff back. And I think the discussions at a national and international level 
is not whether to return results, but how do you turn results. And as an oversight person, there are huge, huge issues with this. You know, what do you return? You have the whole CLIA stuff, you know, the Clinical um, Labs Improvement Act. If it's not done in a CLIA at lab, what CLIA will tell you is you can never give it to the participant. What HIPAA says is, yo, yeah, got to give it to him anyway. So we, again, we have another disharmony at the federal level. Um, who do you give it to? Just that participant? What if the participant's three months old? Um, what if the participant died and had some hideous genetic variant that you found in research? Um, is the information valid? Uh, when do you return it? At the end of the whole study or as soon as you find it? How do you do it? Hey, you were positive. No. Okay? Or and you, if you ask people, they want an in-person discussion. They don't want a phone call. They want to talk about it. Particularly, a lot of this is being driven by genetics just because the number of results coming in. Um, but this is not a genetics only discussion. And you really get into the problem of are you providing clinical care? And a number of our PhD investigators are like, whoa, man, I didn't get an MD for good reasons. I don't like talking to people. Um, <laughs> sorry for all the PhDs in the crowd. <laughs> but, you know, uh, if you're not a trained clinician, you should not be given. But you can imagine getting, you know, as a very good researcher saying, you know, we found this variant and, you know, it was for sudden cardiac death. Um, it's usually on a Friday afternoon that you make these calls. And um, anyway, it's so the person saying, well, what should I do? And it's like, well, I'm not a cardiologist. I guess I'd find a cardiologist. I mean, you can just see the problems here. What the revised rule does is one of the new things that you're supposed to put in the informed consent form is this, is this a statement regarding whether clinically relevant research results, including individual research results, will be disclosed to subjects, and if so, under what conditions? Personally, I think this doesn't reflect the reality of where we are today, nor address the needs that we have today. So I think this was, I think for this, the, final, the revised rule gets a fail. God, I'm so negative, aren't I? <laughs> but is there hope? Um, I think there may be. The guidance is promised. Uh, I think the lack of guidance has really been a hindrance for institutions. And this has been a 88 month process. The fact that we don't have guidance, I think is very questionable. Um, the areas that we really need guidance on are the informed consent. What is this key elements thing? Give us some ideas. There are issues um, on some of the exempt categories. There's like a brand new exempt category, which we didn't have time to get into for like behavioral research. What exactly is that? What do we look for? Um, the, the common rule brings HIPAA in for the first time. How are we going to do that? So there are a number of areas where guidance really is needed. And I'm hoping that with guidance, there'll be more of a back and forth and we can get to a better position. The FDA is committed and actually has to be committed to harmonization, which will be good. I think that the, my third bullet here is probably a little Pollyanna-ish. But I think as we start pushing for institutions which love relegating everything to the IRB, the IRB is the pit of where you don't know, need, yeah, where you don't know where to send other things to. That didn't come out well. Um, anyway, we are like the recipient of every unfunded mandate for the institution. You know, if there's an I in it, it comes to the IRB. <laughs> I mean, it's like we got stuck with ct.gov you know, as an IRB office, which, why couldn't compliance have taken that? No, you guys, you know, it's a research. Anyway, so I think as we start saying to institutions, you know, IRB, we're not going to review exempt research. We're not going to review anything that doesn't need continuing review. We need two more FTE, five minutes remaining. I'm going to take two, watch you. Okay, we are going to need more FTEs for you guys to do your institutional review. How do you think that'll go over? Yeah, that'll go really well. Um, but I think it may make the point. The institution has a huge role in the protection of human subjects. And, you know, the HRPP, which is Human Subject Protection Program, the IRB is only one piece. And I think maybe this will help the institution step up and say, yeah, we own a lot of this, other than just supporting the IRB 
and it may be a wake-up call to investigators. Perhaps the changes in the informed consent form will start a real discussion. I'm hoping. Um, there were many topics here I did not discuss. Um, a big one, single IRB. Um, NIH came out with a policy uh, about a year ago where we had to start implementing that um, last January, and that was for NIH-funded domestic multi-site research. The common rule, it's regardless of funding, domestic multi-site research, you need to use a single IRB. If you are using, a, and single IRB sounds fabulous. You know, rather than go to 19, you just go to one, you get the ask, wonderful. Single IRB is great for some studies, but to say across the board everything, a problem. And I think it does not address the nightmares that we're having, both relying on an external IRB as well as serving as a central IRB for a number of studies. Um, and I think that area is a disaster waiting to happen. So I think to promote single IRB for types of research should have been the way to go, but instead it's a blunt instrument. So at the end of the day, am I satisfied or disappointed? <laughs> well, guess which? <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, I hope that there will be, you know, more back and forth and opportunity with the development of guidance. Um, I think that the oversight of human subjects research is incredibly important. Um, even though I've said all these things here, um, we do follow the rules. There is a process. And I think, you know, as Carrie had said, a discussion with all the agencies, et cetera, is incredibly important. So I shall end there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Rourke. That was fascinating, funny, and really entertaining, as well as important and relevant and interesting. So we have uh, openings for questions and answers for a little while here. Please come to the mic, identify yourself, speak clearly. Hi, Tucker LeBean, Lab Medicine and Pathology Pearls. Thank you so much for such a thoughtful presentation. I want to harken back to the question that Dean Tolar read from uh, a faculty member, I believe, at UMD about an hour ago that touched on kind of the, 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 um, the realities of the public trust. So given that we live in a society now where there are a significant number of individuals who have great mistrust of government, great mistrust in the health system, some of this has led to really hardened views about vaccines, et cetera, in the context of the IRB and the common rule, uh, do you think that your uh, development of policy and the conversations that you have are influenced by those perspectives in any way? Absolutely. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it almost worked. Um, no, I th absolutely, I, I agree with that. I think um, when I give a talk on well, how does the IRB decide what to do, you know, it's federal regulations, it's state and local regulations, and for us, it's the Boston Globe. Hmm. You know, for you guys, it's going to be what, the Minneapolis Tribune or something, whatever, I don't know what paper is here. Um, but yeah, that really impacts us. And I think I would go back to the concept of an HRPP, or Human Research Protection Program, of which the IRB is one piece, the institution is a piece, investigators are a piece, you know, how you deal with grants and contracts is a piece of the institutional one, and the participants have to be a piece of that. And I think what, um, I don't think the total responsibility is on the IRB. I think it is really on the institution. And what we are seeing are more and more um, public consulting groups. And they can be ad hoc, they, I mean, like our biobank, you know, we have a public committee uh, that anytime we come up with a new policy, we kind of run it by them first. How do you think we'll still track, et cetera? So I think involvement of the public um, is an absolute necessity. I think finding those people who are willing to come forward and really put in the time and the energy to learn what the science is and then to really be able to have a good conversation is a challenge. Um, and it's gonna vary by your institutions. Um, but yeah, I think the, the public trust is huge. 
The other concern I have is, you know, what, what ends up in the media is like so dangerous. You know, the media is going to say, oh, subject or participant. Actually, I'll go back to the Jesse Gelsinger days. This was the boy who died in the uh, gene transfer experiment at the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the headlines was something like, um, it, gene research kills teenager, kills. So I was talking to a group of journalists, and so I was using different examples. I said, I, said, I think this is like a little too far out there. They said, well, what'd you say? I would say, teenager dies in a gene experiment. I said, I think the word kill versus dies in is very different. But they did kill him, didn't they? I mean, so what gets in the press is kills. I mean, and, you know, and you can like backpedal a million times. Um, bad things are gonna get the front page of the paper. There will never be an article on 9,000 research protocols done without a problem at Partners Healthcare. Even I wouldn't read that, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's like one bad thing screws everything up. And I think we don't do a very good job of promoting what we do. Um, I think institutions, I have no idea what it's like here at Minnesota, but we have tried for many years to try to really get a conversation going um, that when you come to one of our hospitals, we are very engaged in research. And we to do this in a very congratulatory way, that you know we are gonna look at your medical records. We're gonna look at your excess specimens. We'll do it in a protected way, and these are the good things we're gonna find out about it. You may be asked to be in some research. And it's the clinicians go, oh, you don't wanna scare them. Don't tell them that. And you go, but that's what we're doing. So I think at a national level, how research is done, how it's overseen, what are the benefits of it? I mean, I used to use my mother, who is now deceased, as the example. So I said, you know, so, her name was Eleanor. Eleanor, you think your doctor ever shares your information with someone? Oh, he would never do that. He is so good. He's so confidential. I said, well, you know, when you came in with, like, the flu last year, he sent your stuff off to the state lab, and basically, you know, they're tracking who's getting the flu, and maybe you were the first case, and that'll help. Oh, I want him to do that. You know, it's all education. And we have done a very poor job of that. Oh, God, a Susan Wolf question. Is there anyone else who wants a question? <laughs> uh, I'll resist return of results. I oh, wanted good. to ask you about, to expand on some of the landmines in the informed consent area, because it's so pivotal. Um, the debate about broad consent, you know, this new option to elicit broad consent, and the debate over, is that really consent? I mean, if people are just are, are kind of broadly consenting to future research uses, do they actually know what they're consenting to? And the remaining gaps, this is so this is back to your gaps, uh, on adults without decisional capacity or with questionable decisional capacity, and how you really construct a good consent process in that circumstance. How much time do we have? <laughs> Um, no, that, those are all incredibly good questions. I'll just like do a few things on each, but I think the landmines in the informed consent is it has become a legal document. And particularly if you're doing a study with an industry sponsor, they want every last little detail in there. Um, and now with data sharing, you know, if you're putting stuff into dbGaP, you have to have dbGaP language. If you're putting it into this report, you have to have this language. You look at our informed consent forms, I can barely understand where data is going. So we're trying to like pack in too much. Um, and actually the idea of the key elements, I sort of like, I would have put it at the end though, and kind of here's a summary once you've gone through. Um, or maybe expand it a bit to say, here are the real, you know, do all the adverse events, do all of the potential benefits, and have an addenda that, you know, maybe see there's, see there's some other things you should think about. Um, but I think it's just too dense, too much, too, too legalistic. They never get read. And if they're read, they're not understood. Um, there are studies out there where, <laughs> You know, they'd have people read a consent form that says there'll be absolutely no benefit to you and, you know, thank you for helping research go forward. And you ask them a half hour later, how come you signed up? It's going to make me better. That's what I wanted. Or people don't even remember that they're in a study. So we spend all this time trying to come up with this, quote, perfect form where, well, Doc, what would you, should I just sign this? Just tell me what to do. I don't really need to read this. Uh, so it's also a process. 
you know, the investigator should be sitting down with that person, going through, this is what it is, what questions, um, and then asking questions. Do you understand what I said? A lot of participants, it's interesting, uh, some investigators have tried doing quizzes, like, you know, either online or as a paper, and that is very off-putting to participants. You know, I just read this and now you're quizzing me? I am out of here. So anyway, I think getting into what is palatable to present and then how do you possibly, you know, do that in a reasonable way. Um, the issue about, the middle issue about the broad consent, this is one of the, there are two new exempt, there are three new exempt categories, but two of them refer to broad consent. And the idea here is that you would get broad consent from people saying, I would like to use your identifiable data and biospecimens for future research. And people would have the opportunity to say no or yes. And if they say no, you can never use that stuff for research. You can't even waive consent in the future. Um, and the reason there are two exempt categories of the broad consent, one was, is with gathering it, and the second is with then giving that information out. Um, I know of no academic institution that's instituting those two exempt categories. It's just logistically impossible. Yet the concept of broad consent, uh, we have a biobank, and many places do, and our consent is broad. You know, if you will let us have some of your fill in the blank, blood, you know, tumor, whatever, um, we are going to use this for research that right now we can't really tell you all potential uses, but what we do is put in, you know, it could be for like for reproductive purpose, psychiatric, we try to like at least hit on things that may be a little bit more problematic for people. Um, and if, you know, you're uncomfortable with this, no is a good answer for not coming in. But I think my concern with the new exempt categories called broad consent is it ignores the fact we already use broad consent for a lot of stuff. And yet this broad consent is this other, I'm sorry, I'm going too far down that rabbit hole. The issue of um, people who have diminished capacity, um, it is a huge thing. Who gives, who gives consent for those people? Um, you know, states have their own laws. Um, you know, even if, you know, I may be incompetent to give consent today, but tomorrow I'm okay. You have to come back to me and get a consent at that time. Um, there's really nothing in the regs that really, I think, help with the processes of that, but I think it just exaggerates any problem with consent. Um, so anyway, thank you for getting up and getting me out of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Don Brunquell from the Center for Bioethics here at the U. Um, and great talk. You summarized some of the issues really well. Um, I wanted to ask about the role of IRBs in monitoring investigators' processes like informed consent, and if not the IRB, who does it? Okay, great question. Um, the IRB has the authority to monitor I know a few IRBs that have the capacity to monitor. That's the problem. Um, we do have a quality improvement program, which is separate. I, also, I oversee that, but it's separate from the IRB. We don't let them be on the IRB, et cetera, where we will do deep dives into um, any research that we think is problematic. We do it with first timers. We do it with a first time IND or IDE. They have to come in and have a special session with us. Um, and we will certainly look at what they have for documentation of their processes. But it is a rare situation when we actually send someone in to sit and watch. There'll be the occasional protocol where it's incredibly high risk and the only person who really can give consent is the PI who's also the clinician where we feel there needs to be another person there. But those are pretty rare. I think, so I think this is another gap. Um, I think it would be extraordinarily helpful. After Jesse Gelsinger died, actually it was at a point where I was working at NIH, one of the suggestions was made that every informed consent process should have an ombudsman in the room to monitor the process. And I'm like, where are you going to find these people? I mean, you know, so again, it's, you can't have something for everything. Maybe you should dial down. But I think it's an area we should spend more time on. Dr. Yee. Hi. I'm, hi I, I'm Doug Yee. I'm a medical oncologist. And I was really interested in the VIN number as an identifier, and you didn't get to it. Um, but I, the reason I'm asking 
um, is some of the research that we're doing is linked through cell phone and, or social media apps to try to get at certain things like patient reported outcomes, for example. So that's an identifier, and your, your definition of human subject is, I think my cell phone is probably a human subject because it certainly can clearly be traced back and identified to me. So that's one part of the question, how do we deal with that? But the, another part is, why do we consider human participation in human subjects research different than other things? So lots of people are doing market research on us through what our habits and what we do. They can identify us very clearly. Um, yeah, that's why we get pushed ads all the time after you search for something. Mm -hmm. So why is this different than that? And should, we, is, should there be a larger common rule for I think any a lot of, Yeah, I think a lot of people would argue marketing re, it's marketing research and maybe the word research should be listened to. I mean, I think you're right. It's, uh, you know, I think we have stronger regulations because I think it kind of birthed out of drug A versus drug B concept. But now we're really getting into so much of the data stuff. I see very little difference between marketing research and this. Um, so I, again, a conversation. The issue about, um, I'm gonna call them apps, is huge. Um, and we actually have created a separate ancillary review for any time somebody wants to use an app of any sort, where we look at, you know, what is the security of, what's the platform, who owns the data, um, what is the end user license agreement, or the EULA, um, and it has to go through a formal separate review before the IRB will even consider it. And there are many situations where we just say, no, you can't do that. And, they, and, it's, and it's weird that, you know, a lot of these apps out there, um, it's like the Trojan horse. You know, they just want to get in, so then they have your information, they can sell, you know, send you all this other stuff. So, huge area. Um, again, another unfunded mandate that we have to, you know, pay for somebody to do this separate review. But it is, I think that's an area that a lot of people are actually looking in as a research um, issue. And it's a very um, unregulated area. Uh, and I think the FDA is also having a problem with it. Is it really for health care or, you know, whatever? So I think your questions are all valid and my answers are lacking. I'm sorry. So we have time for two quick questions, one from the floor and then one from uh, someone listening to the webinar. So go ahead, please. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Harmelink. I am a technician for the biorepository here at the university, as well as a public health grad student. Um, I've worked in the operating room for the last six years at Fairview as well. I, listening to your talk, uh, thank you by the way, I have been thinking about the difference between permissions for HIPAA and for the common rule. And you have on there that authorization for HIPAA and informed consent are different, and we run into that with research. I would like to get your opinion on how we approach a certain subject with authorization versus conform, informed consent. So in the clinical setting, they ask patients if they would like to opt out. And that is where they're targeting patients for this authorization. In my experience, they have someone who works as an admitting person who says, so, would you like to participate in research while you're here? Yes or no? And that is as informed as their authorization is, and then we no longer um, approach those patients for informed consent. What is your opinion on the different levels of this? Okay, I, I think you're, you're, there's a number of topics you're bringing in. Um, doing the last one first, this as patients come into your institution, a number of institutions are saying, can we approach you for research in the future? It's agnostic to a particular protocol, but it's just getting permission for, that's not research consent. That is just giving permission, yes, you can contact me. And so I see that, and it's a huge issue, but I think it's a separate thing. And I don't know as institutions can really respect a person who says no. In that, you know, we're still gonna use your data likely. I mean, so anyway, that's an issue. The difference between the um, authorization and, which is the HIPAA one and the informed consent, institutions have done this very different ways. We use a merged form. So everything is in one form, but that's a problem, and that some of it's duplicative just because of the weird stuff HIPAA wants you to have there. I think if we could harmonize that, it would be fabulous. Other institutions use separate forms, which I think is also 
confusing to participants. Um, I think a little bit more confusing than a merged form, and it can be off-putting. I just signed something, now what do you want me to sign? So that, unfortunately, is very institution-specific. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time, and so the remaining question that I have from someone listening online, I'm going to give to Dr. O'Rourke, and she, might, she will answer it personally. I want to have, ha, help me in thanking her for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.